Good morning. Reading from Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 20. <coughs> Excuse me. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all both Jews and Greeks are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. If you uh, have looked around the walls of the sanctuary any time in the last, I don't know, three, four months, I think it's been, you'll notice the banners that say sin, salvation, sovereignty, and service. These are major themes in the book of Romans. And actually, sovereignty, we could make salvation part two if we wanted to, but I thought sovereignty looked better on the banner than salvation part two. Um, so... We're trying to get at the heart of what the Apostle Paul is saying in this ancient letter that he wrote to the saints who are at Rome. And these are the milestones that we're observing as we journey along this Romans road to salvation. I want to say that it's not like an outline in the way that we think of it in modern times where having dispensed with sin, Paul goes on to salvation and from there to sovereignty and from there to service. All of these ideas are found at all the various points along the way. They're just emphasized a little bit more in certain parts of the book. So in chapters one through three, we've noticed especially the idea, the concept of sin. Right after his very brief introduction Paul dove straight in. He, he gave us his thesis statement in Rome, Romans 16, 1, 16, and 17, where he wrote, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So just to make the point that I was talking about just a minute ago, there's sin even here in this thesis statement of Paul. The gospel would not need to be the power of God for salvation unless we needed to be saved. The gospel would not need to be the power of God for salvation unless there is something in this world, something in our lives, something that's just endemic to all of humanity that requires that we be saved. And one aspect of that is that in our time where people have begun to deny that sin is even a thing, it's, it's such an unpopular topic these days, where it's denied or where it's maybe acknowledged once in a while in a confession and absolution or something along those lines, but then largely ignored through the rest of the week, we find people think they have no need, really, for salvation or for change. People who imagine that they are basically good all on their own just can't imagine the need for a savior. Now, of course, salvation is here in Paul's thesis statement as well because the gospel is the power of God for salvation for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. So we have not only the reality of salvation, we see the means, we see the mechanism as well. The righteous, the just, shall live by faith. One of the battle cries of the Reformation, one of the reasons why we are a Reformed church. Because we need a Savior, we need to be saved, 
and we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and all of this in Christ alone. There is no other way. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. If we turn and walk away from Christ, having heard the message of the gospel but not believed it, there's just no other hope for us to turn to. As to sovereignty, the gospel, as Paul wrote, is the very power of God. We need to be clear on this. The gospel is not the power of God to actually cleanse us from our sin. The gospel does not do that. Only the blood of Christ Jesus, the Son of God, can actually cleanse our sin, can pay the debt that we owed to him. But the gospel is the power of God for salvation in the sense that this is the means, this is the mechanism that God has chosen through which his spirit gives life to those who are dead in transgressions and sins. The gospel is the means by which God extends his gracious call, his effectual call to his elect people. The truth is, we already see service here as well. The righteous, we are told, shall live by faith. And this is the heart of the matter for Paul. By the gospel, by the word of Christ, the Spirit brings us to repentance and faith, and we experience salvation in his name. But that's just the beginning In the same way in which we've seen these young adults stand up here at the front of the church and profess faith, that's not an end point. It's not the beginning either. That journey began for some of them quite a long time ago when they were brought up here for baptism. And now as they make their way down this road, they have stood before God and before the church or before God in his church and have said, I believe in Jesus Christ. He is my Lord and my Savior. That's not graduation. We're going to give them a book. But it's not graduation. It's not the end. It's just the beginning of a life of discipleship, following Jesus, bearing fruit unto eternal life, letting the Spirit work out that salvation that he worked in so that in word and in deed, as they live in this world and walk in this world, they will bring glory and honor and praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit brings us to that point of repentance and faith, and then God works in us. He imputes the righteousness of Christ to us in a legal sense. That's something that has been done. As it says in Lord's Day 23, God grants and credits to us the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ as if we had never sinned or been a sinner, as if we had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for us. All of that happens. And all we need to do is to accept this gift of God with a believing heart, and it's done. God has imputed to us, and we'll see far more about this in later chapters of the book of Romans, but God has already Imputed to you, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, the righteousness of Christ. We need to carry this with us through the day because there are so many times when we're tempted. We're tempted to sin on the one hand, and on the other hand, we're tempted to think that we're just not worth anything. We think that in our own heart, and other people reinforce that to us from time to time. That, no, you're a sinner. God doesn't care about you. But God grants and credits to me and to you. To those who believe the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ. As if I had never sinned or been a sinner. As if I had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me. Beyond that, declaration though that imputation of the righteousness of Christ Lord's Day 1 already tells us that there are further implications to this because I belong to him Christ by his Holy Spirit not only assures me of eternal life but also makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live to him live for him 
And that's why it's so important we don't just memorize the first little couplet there. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And then we walk away saying, well, that's comforting, isn't it? I belong to him no matter what. And you do. But there's implications to that belonging because you belong to him. Christ is working in you by his Holy Spirit. He is assuring you of the promises of God and he does that through the fruit of the Spirit that he bears in your life. You remember love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, that kind of stuff. And not only that, we're told that the Holy Spirit is within us to make us wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Now I want you to ask yourself, if you are wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly willing and ready for something, what happens? That thing happens. I remember when I was younger going to an amusement park in Denver, Colorado, and it was, it was one, I think it's still there, but it's changed so much. It had one of those old wooden roller coasters, and I had always been kind of afraid of heights. Um, and so I remember standing there looking at how tall that thing was and watching as the cars went around how it just shook back and forth and thinking, I don't know. This thing just doesn't look safe to me. Maybe I won't go on this ride. And then there was this girl. This was a long time ago before I met my wife. There was this young woman who was a year or two older than me. And I had a massive crush, and she wanted to go on the roller coaster, and she wanted to ride in the front seat. But nobody else would do it with her. So she came, and she asked me, do you want to ride with me on the roller coaster? I just want to go in the front, and nobody else will do it. I became wholeheartedly willing and ready to get on that coaster and to go for that ride. There was nothing short of somebody tying me up that could have stopped me. And the Heidelberg Catechism is saying when the Spirit is at work in us by the grace of God, that's how he drives us to these works that God prepared beforehand for us to do. He drives us into that space where we don't obey the law of God because, oh, it's the law. I hate driving 100 on this highway. <laughs> we obey the law of God because we love God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. And we want to please our Father in heaven. And the Holy Spirit does this to the extent that the catechism goes on to say it is impossible for those grafted into Christ by true faith not to produce fruits of true gratitude. So if we're asking ourselves that question, do I truly believe? Am I really a child of God? What are we to do? We're to look to the fruit that the Holy Spirit bears in our lives. That's where assurance can be found. As I've said before in this series, not by having signed a gospel tract sometime 40 years ago and stuck it in my wallet and carrying it around, but by looking at life and saying, the Spirit is at work there. The Spirit is bearing fruit there. The Spirit is even the one who makes us feel conviction of sin and who drives us to repentance, who drives us to confession. So sin, salvation, sovereignty, and service, all right there in those two verses which we looked at weeks ago in Romans chapter 1, but these are the themes of the book of Romans. And in this early part of the book, sin has been written in large letters. No sooner had Paul finished that thesis statement, but he started telling us that the Gentiles, the nations, those who are alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise are all sinners. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. The Gentiles, the nations, that's us, by the way, they're sinners, every last one of them. And all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. The Gentiles are sinners. 
we have sinned without the law of God and short of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, we will perish without the law of God. But then in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, in a passage that was almost certainly directed at those who did have the covenants of promise, old covenant Israel, Paul wrote, therefore you have no excuse, O man of you, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. So even so, all who have sinned without the law will perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Now, what does that mean, particularly for those who are depending on obedience to the law for salvation? And at this point, I don't care and I don't think Paul cares. If you call yourself a Jew and you're depending on the law for salvation, or if you call yourself a Christian, but you are depending on adherence to some moral code for your salvation, it makes no difference at all. All who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Well, that raises some questions. If the law cannot save, and it can't, and it never could, then what was the point? Well, Romans chapter 3. Then what advantage has the Jew, or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God, which is to say they had the word of God. God gave them his law, he gave them the prophets, he gave them his word. Where the nations at that time were stumbling around in darkness, the Jews had the light of God's word, as do we in the church today. What then if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, and this is a topic that will come up again when we get into that sovereignty section. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. Literally, I speak as a man. By no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie, the truth of God abounds to his glory, sorry, um, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. Now that's, that's a whole nother sermon, as we used to say down in the South. And we're not going to hear it today. But suffice it to say this, what Paul has done there is just build a list of people who deserve what's coming. And they deserve it good and hard. But his point was not really about them. Instead, in verse 9, he asks, what then, are we Jews any better off? Their condemnation is just. He just established that. Are we better off than those people whose condemnation is just? The question is referring directly to Old Covenant Israel, of course, but it really refers to anyone who has the word of God but doesn't hold to it. Anyone who hears the word of God but doesn't put it into practice. So it can refer to us in this new covenant era too. And if we do that, are we any better than those under the Old Covenant who did it? Paul says their condemnation is just. The thing is, our condemnation is just. Consider the rest of the verse. No. Are we any better? No. Not at all. Watch the repetition of these negatives in this section of Romans. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. In fact, it is written... This is the word of the Lord. That's what that little phrase, it is written, means. None is righteous. No, not one. No one 
understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and misery in the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And again, we could go back to all of those Old Testament references. And there's a sermon in every one of them. But for now, from head to toe, from their mouths to their feet, and encompassing everything in between, Paul is saying, none is righteous, no, not even one. As I said this a couple of weeks back, if we think we're good enough because we are better in our own eyes than others, or if we think once again in our own estimation that we're just pretty darn good people, then we need to think again and we need to think hard because we're not. No one is righteous, not even one, not a zippo, nothing, not one. So we need to keep that in mind, not only as those who have the remnant of the law written on the heart and have turned away from it, but even as those who have received it on tablets of stone. For verse 19, and this is kind of the top of the first hill, that we come to on this Romans road says, for we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world held accountable to God. Now, the point that Paul's making is that those who were not under the law, they didn't need that to have their mouths stopped and be held accountable to God. That was obvious. Now he's saying those who were under the law, those who are under the law, they need to sit down and be quiet too. Jew and Gentile, male and female, old and young, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, everyone, that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. This is the point of all that we've been looking at. This was the purpose of the law all along because by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin, which means in the first place that the law is our enemy. It is, as Paul referred to it elsewhere, the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands. But it also means that in another sense, there's a gracious aspect to the law words of God. And for just this reason, because through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Lord's Day 1 of the Heidelberg Catechism, having taught us that our only comfort in life and in death is to be found in our knowing that we belong, body and soul, to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, goes on to ask the question, question 2. What must you know to live and die in the joy of this comfort? Well, three things, according to the catechism. And maybe the first takes us by surprise just a little bit, even if we know what's coming. First, how great my sin and misery are. You want to live in the joy, in the comfort of knowing that you belong to God, body and soul, in life and in death. You want that for yourself. You want it for others. This is where it starts. It doesn't start with us looking at ourselves, God forbid, or at others, and saying, you know what? That, we do this with celebrities sometimes. We look at someone who we're, you know, we watch them. Online, and we think, wow, they're so close to the kingdom of God. Wouldn't it be awesome if God would just get hold of them and, and bring them into his kingdom and then all these amazing things would follow because they have like six million followers on Twitter. I remember talking to some people who felt that way when Kanye West uh, first proclaimed his Christianity. People think, oh, that's great. People are going to just flock into the kingdom of God behind him. Well, not so much. 
but we do it with other people too. We look at others, even in our own families, our own community, we think they are really nice people and they really, really are. Wouldn't it be great? Imagine the impact they could have for the kingdom of God if they would just turn to Jesus in all of that niceness. But it doesn't start there. The first thing that we need to know about ourselves if we want to live and die in the joy of knowing that we belong to God, body and soul, in life and in death, is how great our sin and misery are. Paul's been working on that for three chapters. And here's where the law comes in. Question and answer three in the Heidelberg. How do you come to know your misery? Well, the law of God. The law of God tells me. So it's my enemy because it makes me understand how far I fall short of the glory of God. But it's also my friend because it points me to the one place where I can find salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And this is saying that before you can know the grace and the glory and the goodness of salvation, you have to know what it is from which you need to be saved. We need to know it for ourselves, and we need the law of God to teach us, because if our debt really was as small as some of us may have imagined it to be, then we can probably also imagine finding a way to pay it ourselves. If our sin is just a small thing, we're really pretty good. We don't need a lot of salvation. We just need a little salvation. Well, then our salvation's just a little salvation. And a little salvation is no salvation. But when we understand the extent of our unrighteousness, looking into the mirror of God's law, then we can understand that salvation can only be found in the infinite grace and mercy of God. We need the word of God to teach us the depths of our own depravity so that we can understand the immeasurable grace that has been shown to us in Christ Jesus. God doesn't come along and put his arm around us and say, you know what, you're a pretty nice person, so you know, I'm, I'm just going to pay that extra little premium that you can't afford so that you can get into heaven. God comes along to us where we are dead in our trespasses and sins and raises us up with Christ. Paul will come back to this in Romans chapter 5, writing, Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We need this perspective for ourselves so that we will never trust in ourselves, but we'll trust only in Christ our Savior and our surety. We need this perspective when it comes to others too, or we might imagine, as I said, we might think of them as good people. We might even think they're probably good enough that somehow they will be okay in the end, even if they don't repent and turn to God through faith in Jesus Christ. Because we have this tendency, if you don't believe me, just attend some memorial services. We have this tendency to think that if someone is basically a decent person, kind to their family and friends, kind to animals, and beloved by all, then surely God must feel the same way about that person that we do. But God doesn't ever hold us up to our standards of niceness. Rather, through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And the gospel that we proclaim to others is not a gospel of give Jesus a try and he will give you your best life now. The gospel we proclaim begins here. You were dead. In the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, that would be the devil, by the way, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. That's the first step. Because through the law, through the word, comes the knowledge of sin. And this is where we start. This is the first thing that we need to know. The first step that we take along the road. But thanks be to God. 
For the second thing we must know comes right out of this. How we are set free from all of our sins and misery. See, if the Romans road ended here, it wouldn't be the Romans road to salvation. It would be the Romans road to despair or the Romans road to hell. But it doesn't end here. The next step, the next word in our text makes this clear. But. It's a little conjunction, de, in Greek. But now, in contrast to what we've been saying, and also because of what we've been saying, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Not for those who keep the law, not for those who keep most of the law, for those who understand exactly who they are in the eyes of God and yet believe that in Christ alone our hope is found, that in Christ alone and through faith in him, God can look at the worst, the worst that we might do in our lives, the worst that others have done. I'm aware of the story of a man who told his family during World War II that he had been taken away by the Nazis to serve as a slave, and then he came home when the war is over, and he got married, and he emigrated. And he had a life here in Canada, but it wasn't very good. And towards the end of that life, he confessed freely. He had been excommunicated from his church, and that troubled him as he drew near to death. And so he called his pastor and said, can you come and meet with me, bring an elder? So they did. And he spent the next couple of hours spelling out, I was not a slave. I volunteered. And I went with the Nazis to the Eastern Front and I participated in the killing of Jews. you think God could forgive me for that? And his pastor, God bless him, looked him in the eye and he said, you know what? It doesn't matter what it is. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's nothing you have done that is so good that it could ever amount to anything that would get you into heaven. There is nothing you have done that is so bad that it could ever keep you out if you have come to God through faith in Jesus Christ. The righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Thanks be to God yet again because the first thing that we must know leads us to the second thing. And if the Lord is willing, this will be our text next Sunday, but let's end with it this morning too. Romans 3, verses 21 and verse 20 to 24. Through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This is the faith to which we hold, the faith which we profess. And may God give us all ears to hear and hearts to believe everything that we must know. Let's look to him in prayer. Father, if we 
are tempted to think that somehow we are good enough, that we are better than others, that we deserve your favor where others don't. Then break us, humble us, cause us to repent and turn to you in Christ alone. And on the other hand, Father, if we look at our lives and we look at the things that we have done and we think, I'm so wicked. There's no way that God could ever love me. Then, Father, break that in us as well. Assure us of your love for us in Christ Jesus. Draw our eyes to you, not through the filthy filters of our own good works, but, Father, through the righteousness and the holiness and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Call us to you. Work in us all that is pleasing to you through your Holy Spirit. Give faith and give repentance. And Father, begin that process of sanctification during which you will bear fruit in our lives, fruit to eternal life, and fruit to the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, and of his kingdom. We come in his name. Amen.